This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. And today, we have the one and only Miss Lauren Montgomery, who actually is in Florida where we are, except she's down in the other end where I don't like to drive. Just yeah, going to go ahead and throw that border. out there. South of the border. We got it. We know. Yeah, <laughs> it's... Um, you know, every every couple of years we'll actually do a drive to Key West instead of flying, and I always remind myself why I don't live in Miami when I drive through yeah. that area. It's well, just... I'm not in Miami. There's a big difference between where I am in Miami. I'm in West Broward, which is um, West Fort Lauderdale on the other side, and we actually call it East Naples because I'm so far west. I'm sort of almost in the Everglades, but I get hmm. your point. Yeah, absolutely. So talk a little bit about your background. I mean, we were we were chatting for a few seconds right before we started recording, but why don't you uh, give everybody sort of the 10,000-foot overview of, of how you got to where you're at? Absolutely. So um, I graduated from college in upstate New York with my psychology degree, which is about as useful as, oh, nothing, um, unless you're going to finish and go through all the way to the end and get your doctorate. And so... Um, you know, when you get your psychology degree, what do you do? You go into sales. So I had a job that wasn't really getting me anywhere. And I had an aunt that owned a personnel agency down here in South Florida. And she said, come down, I'll get you a really good job. She said, I'll set up some interviews for you and we'll make this happen. And she did set up some interviews. One of them was with Liberty Mutual. And I moved from Florida on a Monday. I had my first interview with Liberty Mutual that Friday. Uh, three rounds of interviews later, I got hired as a producer for them and had a lovely 23-year career um, on the company side. Really, really liked it. Uh, did extremely well. Um, so were but- you were you part of that group that was in middle market that when they sold the book to Gallagher, you had the option to either go to Gallagher or not? I actually bailed two years before because... Okay. I was at a uh, Liberty Leaders function, which is for the top producers, and I had the opportunity to hear Gary, I'm um, sorry, um, Ted Kelly speak. And Ted Kelly was the then CEO of Liberty. And one of the producers was expressing concern about the fact that we were constantly butting heads with Liberty owned companies that were not Liberty branded companies. The most significant one at the time was Summit Bridgefield. Mm. And they were just kicking our butt all over town on the workers comp side. And one of the producers said to Ted Kelly, it's a little disconcerting because we're Liberty Mutual, but we can only sell Liberty branded products. What, what's your response to that? And he took a breath and he said, you know, I'm not so much concerned about how we generate revenue, just that we generate revenue. And I looked at my then husband and I went, oh my God, they're going agency. I said, you mark my words within three to five years. So I bailed. I, I, I knew Mark Schwartz, who's the CEO of corporate insurance for many, many years. He was a friendly competitor. I respected him. He's a really, really strong agent, very ethical guy. And we had kept in touch over the years and he was constantly in his his firm, wherever he was at the time. And I kept backing off and backing off. But when I saw the the wave of the future with Liberty Mutual, I thought, no, I I don't want to do it this way. I wanted to control my own destiny. So I made the choice to move over from the company side to the brokerage side in 2007. Yeah, that was right before it. Did you know? Yeah. Um, did you know John Keller? 
I don't recognize the name. What did he do? He, he was the, he was my territory manager. He was he'd been a producer for Liberty in the Middle Market. He was my territory manager here in Tampa, and he's the one who gave us our Liberty contract, like right out of the box. As soon as Liberty announced that they were going to start appointing independent agencies, yep. I didn't even have I didn't have Florida Risk then. I was at another agency. He gave us our contract right out of the box. Like three weeks later, he was downsized and we hired him. So, uh, Oh, that's um, funny. I don't recognize the name, although I, we had a lot of dealings with Tampa because that was all the Florida division. So yeah, I'm he's at sure. Gulf Shore now over in uh, Naples. Okay. I don't even recognize the name, which is shocking to me because he would have been there the same time I was there. Mm -hmm. But interesting that you should say that because I did the exact same thing with our territory manager, who was Judy Gruches. I had known her at Liberty and I moved over to CIA in uh, 2007. And the minute that I found out, I called her and we got a contract with Liberty as well. So yeah, yeah we, were, so... we were both strategically on the same page at that point. Well, yeah, I mean, because you guys have been cleaning the, cleaning our plow on the streets for years, you know. I mean, I think that, you know, I don't know how many people had this. I have to believe that a lot of people did. But there was the nod, nod, wink, wink side deal that you had with the Liberty guy, right? We had that, that if you had a piece of business that it was going to fit in Liberty, then you could send it over to uh, – I don't even know if he's still alive. Ralph Barnes. Do you know Ralph? Yes, I love Ralph Barnes. I believe he is, and I believe he's retired now. Yes, yeah, I he has to be Ralph. retired. Yeah, he has to be <laughs> retired because he needed yeah. to be retired back then. I mean, he wasn't a young dude then, but yeah. like everybody in Tampa, like all of the people that I've friends... Guernsey? Did you know Kevin Guernsey? No, I didn't know him. Okay. He was but the Tampa reason I knew too. Ralph is because everybody in Tampa said, hey, if, if you want Liberty to quote this account for you, Get Gotta hit up your boy, Ralph. Yeah, talk so, to Ralph. So Ralph will work a the, deal with you. So here's the funny thing. We were told unequivocally, without question, you never, ever, ever work with brokers, ever, ever, ever. I was the only schmuck that lived and died by the rules, and I never, ever made a side deal with a broker. I never fed them business. They never fed me business. But all those other guys, man, they were doing it right and left, and that's why they were doing their 2 $3 million in, in new business premium every year because they were working those deals. I never did that. My bad. I should have. What was the reasoning you know, that they know. told you not to do that? Um, I guess it's because they were concerned that it would dilute – uh, the the strength of Liberty, it also, they couldn't control you. If you were dealing with brokers on the side and you were feeding business. So at one point when I was with Liberty, Liberty owned Helmsman Insurance Agency, which was a brokerage. And anything that we couldn't place at Liberty, we were supposed to send through. Well, the problem was is that HIA couldn't get anything done. They didn't do it every day like the like the regular brokers did on the on the agency side. Nobody wanted to deal with Helmsman Insurance Agency because they knew it was owned by Liberty and they knew that it was taking business away from their contracted appointed brokers. So they I think the main reason they didn't want us to do that is they were trying to control us and they were offering us Helmsman Insurance Agency as kind of like a is panacea the right word? I don't think so, but whatever, you know, as kind of like our go-to, but it, it was a miserable fail. It was a miserable fail. And I never was successful with anything with that, but interesting. I don't know if I answered your question. Did so I? having yeah. been on both sides of that equation, you know, how do you think Liberty's fared since, you know, you left, you're in the middle market. I'm assuming you represent them now. Uh, you know what's funny about that? I don't because I couldn't find any business to send to them. All of the stuff that I, it's so interesting. And I think about this all the time. So I did 23 years at Liberty and I've been on the brokerage side now for 14 years. I left in 2007. In fact, I'm just having my 14 year anniversary now. And I tried like the Dickens to send business their way. I really did. And they just were not competitive. And it's interesting because, and again, I made my living with them for the first 23 years of my insurance life. Um, and I think about it a lot. It is true that if Liberty wants a piece of business, they will find a way to write it. It's still true to this day. I once in a great while will come up against them and they will clean our clocks if it's something they really want. Uh, but no, I don't re represent them. I don't, I'm not appointed with them and I, and I can't 
I still don't find business to send to them. Because, you know, we can get to them through Halcyon if we need to, and I, I still haven't found a need. You know, I think it's interesting with them, too, because they, for so many years, were perceived to be just red hot, absolutely untouchable, basically yeah. similar to what Federated is when Federated wants something as a direct writer. It's very difficult to compete with them when they're on that portion of the, the their cycle, right? But they have a cycle. Oh, and it's yeah. just like last, you know, two years ago, I, was met, I met with a prospect and he handed me a Federated quote. And he said, I want you, you know, I just want to let you know, I really want to do business with you. But my goodness, they're like a third of the price. And I said, yep. let me let me look at it and see what it looks like. I said, look, I, number one, I'm never going to sell to you on price. But I also understand what my value is. And my value is better than what you're going to get with Federated. But I'm not yep. going to even try and convince you that it's triple. <laughs> so let me let me look at it and just see what the deal is. I looked over the quote. I literally could not find but like maybe one or two minor things to poke yep. holes in. They were giving this guy everything, including the kitchen sink. And yep. I told him, I said, here's my advice. Take it, ride the wave, because in three years, they're going to pull out. They're not going to want you anymore. Then yeah, you can yeah. come back and we'll work on putting together a program for you. And he said, you know what? He goes, I really appreciate the vi your advice and you're dead on the money because 10 years ago I was with them and I was only with them for three years and they pulled out of Florida. Yeah. So, I mean, but it's crazy. And that's, I think that's one of the things that's kind of like frustrating. We, we do represent Liberty, you know, and I think that Liberty has the ability to have a really good product offering, but you, we can't, we can't find what they want. You know, it's like one minute they, they want contractors, then they don't. One minute they're writing workers comp, then they're not. One minute they, you know, they, they have property capacity, then they don't. And I mean, it's like a constantly moving target. And we write in the middle market, right? I mean, I want to stay between a quarter and a half million in premium because that makes it worth, worth the time to invest in these accounts. Okay. Plus, you have the ability to talk about value and deliver a value proposition in that segment yep. of the middle market that you're not going to in the small business. Right. But it seems like, and, and I'm not picking on Liberty by any stretch. So if you're from Liberty and you got your panties in a wad, just get over it. I'm not <laughs> picking on Liberty. This is every national carrier that comes into Florida. Yeah. Right. It, 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 it's like right now, over the course of the last several years, they've all had this huge focus on small business send us your small business send us right. you know the stuff we, we can put this on a bop we can do this we can do this. that's not what we prospect like that's not what we need you for right. and mm -hmm. so it's become you know it's been a real challenge for us to be able to work in the middle market and do what we need to do and try and keep everything together you end up piecemealing programs at this point because you don't Absolutely. really have much of a choice Absolutely. And it's interesting, too, because in my 23 years with Liberty, I saw the expansion and contraction at least a half a dozen times. I and mean, we always knew what was coming from an underwriting perspective based on our bonus plan that they rolled out like January 1st or December 28th or whatever. Every year we'd have our meeting with with our sales team. And based on what they would tell us was going to happen with the bonus plan, we knew what underwriting was going to do the next year. And there were years where they said, you're no longer going to be commissioned. They just structured it completely differently, completely differently. And so there were years that we went hardcore for certain lines of business. And then three, four years later, we literally non-renewed the entire book with the exception of a very small handful of accounts that were like on the advisory board. Wow. And uh, I, it was ridiculous and you never could control. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to move from the company side to the brokerage side, because I felt that I could control it more. I was very successful as a small fish in a big pond, but I just felt like I could make a bigger impact being a bigger fish in a smaller pond. And I'm not sorry for the choice that I made. And I'm not at all sorry that I bailed before the, 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 the buyout. No, I think you were exactly at the right time to leave because the market wasn't saturated with a bunch of ex-Liberty producers. Exactly. You know, looking for a job. So yeah. the one thing I will I will say, and, and you can correct me on this, but in my experience in dealing with people that came up through the old school ranks of Liberty, some pretty decent sales training that, that people got. Pretty good support Absolutely. from the company side. So. That being, and, and specifically with regard to workers' comp, like the guys that yep. I know that were Liberty people 
that 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 went out and wrote nothing but work or led with workers comp they could slice and dice a mod like they had hmm. it all dialed in so i'm interested yep. in how that has translated to what you're doing now i mean i'm su sure that that's helped you along the way and i'm sure you've added a few new tricks to your bag too so what's really funny is um i don't know if you know a guy by the name of bob moore robert moore he was um an old liberty guy he was i never knew him when he was at liberty but he's a very very accomplished he's been all over the industry he's He's built and run PEOs. He knows workers' comp inside and out. And he was our operations guy at CIA for a couple of years. And um, when he first came to, to corporate insurance advisors, he's like, oh, you're from Liberty. And so we started chit-chatting and we did the do you know game. And then we started talking about comp. And he says, all right, so tell me what you know. And what was so interesting is I had never heard the term aggravated inequity the entire 23 years <laughs> I was with Liberty Mutual. And he was talking to me about it. I'm like, I have no idea what that is. And we tease it. I should just have it tattooed on my ass so that I never forget. You know? Yeah, that's <laughs> but, funny. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, I and we didn't have Mod Master at Liberty because we just didn't. I don't even know if it was around then back in the day. But certainly having a working knowledge of an experience mod and how it's calculated and looking at, at if it's done properly. I mean, there were other there are people, produ other producers at CIA at our firm now that in the past have handed me a, a mod worksheet and said, does this look right to you? Well, you look <laughs> at the audited payrolls and they're rounded to the nearest dollar. So your 8810 is 2,300,000. And your 5606 is a million eight. And I'm like, no, of course, this isn't an audited payroll. It would never be an exact mm. dollar amount. So these aren't audited payrolls. Something's wrong. So, yeah, there there is a definite benefit. And, you know, the workings of, I don't play in this space as much as I used to, but the workings of, like, retros and large deductibles and, and uh, loss development and triangulation and all that stuff that we used to do at Liberty, I mean, I think it gave me a really solid background and a backbone for doing what I do now, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So talk a little bit about what you're doing now. You're you're at CIA. Right. Uh, you're crushing it based on what Ciara told me. I mean, if I she says that. To, she... I paid her to say that. <laughs> I paid her to say that. She's my buddy. Yeah, I love her. She's a, she's a she's a really really good girl. I so what's interesting is that the way that I know Sierra is um, when I first started at Sierra. And so when I worked at Liberty, I never ever did any networking or any any um, you know COI sort of center of influence prospecting. I sat with my feet up on the desk and I'd make a handful of phone calls. And everybody would say, well, I already have an agent. And I'd say, yeah, I know you do, but I've got a proprietary product and I'm not going to threaten them in any form or fashion. I'm not going to go after their carriers. They're not going to go after mine. Let me just take a look. If you have what you need, I'll tell you. And if you don't, I'll tell you that too. So, uh, I, you know, I would, and I would win 35, 30 or 35. I mean, my hit ratio was like 35%, which on the company side, I mean, um, the, yeah, the company side is, is a pretty decent hit. You know, on the brokerage side, you don't really want to write anything. I mean, you're trying to go for, obviously, the BOR, and you're looking for a hit ratio more in the 75 to 80% range. But working with Liberty Mutual with my hands mostly tied behind my back and basically one suite of products, a 30, 30 to 35% hit was deemed to be pretty, pretty good based on their assessment. So I never did any networking. Well, when I, when I moved over to CIA and I was on the brokerage side, my um, CEO, Mark Schwartz, said to me, you need to get out there. You need to meet some people. You need to differentiate yourself from the pack. He said, your CPCU is lovely and your 23 years is lovely, but that doesn't mean anything to the general buying public. People need to know you. You need to develop relationships. And I said, okay. So I joined a little networking group called BNI, which was not the right choice for me. I didn't know it at the time. What was good about it is it allowed me to learn how to network and be a good uh, a good connector. And it's still that still serves me to this day. Um, but it's very business to consumer, and obviously I wanted business to business. But through my my dealings with the people at BNI, I met Louis Gravier, who was Sierra's dad, and he owned the agency that she was working at that they subsequently sold, and then she went out on her own. So that's how I know Sierra. 
So, uh, and she's a really, really sharp girl, really smart. I've been mentoring her for, I don't know how many years, but we have a really, really nice working relationship and I admire and respect her a lot. So, and you asked me a question. I don't remember what it was. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Didn't I didn't take I'm my, crushing it. I'm crushing it. So yeah, okay. I was going to say, I don't remember <laughs> what it was either. I didn't take my medicine this morning. So <laughs> got off the hook. Up crushing it at CIA. What am I doing? So, so you know producers tend to be expedient i wouldn't use the word lazy but we tend to be expedient and i'm a very efficient um high functioning person and i tend to go with what's comfortable so i did very well in the construction space at liberty mutual i wrote people like and i don't know that this will mean anything to you because you're further north but bergeron land development was a client of mine he's a big environmental guy down here and he owned a, uh, he owns a very large site work and excavation company, hundreds and hundreds of employees. And he's a cowboy too. You should Google him, Ron Bergeron, very interesting character. But anyway, so I, I wrote his insurance. I wrote Ebsary Foundation, which is the oldest family owned pile driving contractor in in uh, this part of the country. I, I wrote them for many, many years. And, and Farmer and Irwin Corporation, which is a little further north, you might know them. But anyway, so I, I had, a very large suite of contractors that I dealt with for years. And so when I went over to the brokerage side, I just thought, well, I'm going to just keep doing the same thing. I was nice about that is that you did have some of your larger players like your Zurich and your CNAs that that would play in, in on those deals. So I was able to pull in. Well, what jammed me up was I left Liberty and I had a two year non compete. And then even though we were appointed with Liberty, they also, after the sale happened, said Liberty's not going to approve any AORs or BORs for two years after the sale. So even though I had Liberty, I couldn't really access those clients anymore that were still with Liberty. And by the time it all circled back around, the economy had collapsed. And a lot, I mean, I remember I wrote one company that was, um, they did trusses and um, wood products for uh, residential use. And when I wrote them at Liberty, they had 150 vehicles, 400 and something employees. Their workers comp premium alone was a half a million dollars. I had them on a large wow. deductible. And by the time I circled back around to them in 2009 or 10 or whatever it was, they were down to 12 employees, one vehicle. You know, so that happened a lot. That happened a lot. I mean, more than I would, would care to even talk it, about. That time Especially, it did for sure, because yeah. that was right we had so many things going against us in Florida at that point. It wasn't just the fact that the housing market collapsed and all of that. We're, we're, we were also on the heels of what, four or five major storms coming through the state oh, within the back. two or oh, three yeah, years 2005, prior. 2000, oh yeah, awful. Mm -hmm. It was insane. Yep. So how many of those companies ended up being able to recover and, and exist today? Um, I, oh, I would say most of them. I would say probably, you know, at least maybe 75 to 85 percent of the book of business that I had at Liberty was was able to survive. I mean, some of them had to downsize and then come back from it. But, you know, people like Bergeron Land Development are still around. I don't see the hard drives paving trucks around anymore. They're the ones that are the bright orange. They were out of Delray. They were very, very large. I wrote them for a number of years. NCCI was a client. That was kind of a fun uh, hmm. account to work on. Carl Interesting. They're since out of business. I still do business with the uh, the guy that was the owner there, but uh, they're they're long gone. Um, I work with the folks at Eldorado Furniture as well. I know they're still around. So um, I would say most of the. I mean, the, the, my book of business at Liberty was. I wish I had it on the brokerage side, frankly. <laughs> I, I had um, thirty accounts generating 15 million dollars in premium wow how fun is that Man. yeah that was well i mean awesome so it, 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 yeah it's fun it, it's funny because i tell this story a lot um i was in a cic update and they were talking about the the i don't even remember which one it was but the guy that was the instructor somehow got on the conversation of the most successful producer that he knew and the most successful producer that this guy knew had 25 accounts that were all 100,000 or more in revenue. Okay. Revenue? So revenue. They were all 100,000 or more in revenue. He wow. never quit, never quit prospecting. And when he found one that was bigger than the smallest one on his list or in his book, he would add the new one. 
he would take the other one and hand it off and split commission with a younger producer to help them start learning the business and, and get a head start. But I mean, my goodness, two and a half million dollars at a bare minimum mm -hmm. in revenue. Now, it's easy to talk about that and think, wow, this guy's got it made. That dude didn't just walk into the office one day and yeah. say, I'm going to produce 25 accounts, 100,000 or more in revenue. I mean, right. what's the real story behind that? Talk to me about what you did to get there. But I think that the reason that I'm attracted to that story and that thought process really has to do with what I think some of the biggest mistakes that producers make today is they, they, they're not focused. They don't set standards and benchmarks for, you know what, I'm not going to write anything under X number of dollars of premium. And they end right. up thinking they need to write everything that comes in. And, you know, they think that they're making forward progress. And as the agency principal, I look at it as why are you writing all of this unprofitable business? You're actually making it a bad situation for me oh, yeah. this is more you know m more work than what it's worth yeah and i think that, that that if there's one piece of advice that i would give to producers out there and i give this same piece of advice every single week multiple times a week figure out what you're going to write stay in your lane period and i mean it's I not agree. lost on me that you're not writing flower shops and you know main street <laughs> boutiques and everything else i mean you're not writing paving contractors trust yeah. people pile drivers what's that experience like for you and i don't you know to me i don't it, it's very difficult is some is it, a white male in today's day and age to even try and relate to what it would be like but i'm interested in getting in your head a little bit you know what what was that like when you decided hey i'm going to start writing contractors i'm going to go out and start calling on these people what 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 has that journey been like for you because i can tell you that you know i had a buddy of mine that posted on facebook this last week that you know his 16 year old daughter was trying to walk to the bus stop she walked past a construction site and these guys were catcalling her as a 16 year old kid just trying to get to the bus. Lovely. And he said Lovely. in, and he said, these guys no longer have jobs. <laughs> what do you mean? And this guy is a pretty nasty attorney. So I'm fairly certain that he dealt with it. However, he needed to deal with it with the construction company. But I mean, there has to, that, that can't be easy. It couldn't have been easy all along. I'm sure that you've encountered things over the, the time that you've been doing that. How do you push through that? Such a great question. Um, so I'll start by saying that I'm New York, born and raised. So number one, let me just stop you for a second. I wasn't going to profile. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't going to do it. that. I, I am. I am married. I am married to a Jersey girl who, you know, I'm not going to say New York and New Jersey is the same because they're very much different, but there are certain characteristics that ignorant people from the Southeast like me might lump together as being from the quote unquote, that part of the country. But I am married to a strong, independent Jersey woman that don't take crap from anybody, <laughs> including me. So the fact you started out with, well, I am from New York that, okay, you don't even need to say anything other than that. <laughs> I know where you're you going, know. but that being said, you know, finish, finish your question, your answer. Okay, so so I, I, I'm from New York. My father always told me, uh, he called it my sweet, adorable, magnificent, wonderful daughter, you can do anything you set your mind to. He was always my hero. He was always my supporter. The thought never occurred to me, not even for one second, that the fact that I was a female would cause me any kind of difficulty. I'm smart. I'm a hard worker. I know my business. In fact, it's funny because when I came to CIA, Mark teamed me up, my our CEO teamed me up with another producer who was a really strong sales guy. And he's like, you know what, Lauren, I think that you guys should team up because you're really strong technically, but you don't really finesse the sales side of it. Well, yeah, duh, because I'm a consultant. I'm not a sales girl. I'm not, you know, I'm not out there selling used cars. So he said, I think that you, you might learn a little bit more about the finesse of the sales process. But just backing up. So, okay, so I'm from New York originally. 
I'm smart, I'm aggressive. I'm five foot 10. And for a very good period of my life, I was really overweight, like really, really overweight. So my physical, I never went at it as a girl. I always went at it as a knowledgeable insurance person. Now I will tell you that I was involved in a couple of one in particular that I abandoned after a couple of years because it was absolutely a good old boy network and they made no bones about the fact that they were not going to be doing business with any girl. Like they weren't that straightforward about it, but I learned very quickly that hmm. it was not going to be the right spot for me. And I did have some success, but there were probably at least eight businesses in that particular association that I was targeting and I was only successful in converting two of I think it was two so yeah that was below my hit ratio and I realized that I wasn't gonna so anyway so this is a fun story so um should I tell you the guy's name yeah why not nah. he's, he's, he's got a thick skin so I remember I mentioned Ron Bergeron so you got to Google him. I'm like, he's an alligator wrestler. Like, he's a really interesting character. You need to Google him. Anyway. I'm having Ron a hard time getting past Ron Bergeron because all I can think of is Ron Burgundy. Like, every time you say that, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad it's not just, <laughs> it's it's not just me. Will Ferrell in my head. Yeah. So this guy, so this guy is um, a, a major hunter. He's an environmentalist. He lives out on, on, on it, off of a, a US 27 out in the Everglades there. He's got a huge spread. He's, 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 when I would go into his office, you'd have to walk past the conference room, which was this huge long room with dead animals hanging, like he had an alligator and all of this stuff that he had killed. And then you go into the back sanctuary, which was his office, and the wall is completely covered with pictures of him straddling the dead heads of every, you know, lifting up the horns of all these animals that he killed. He wore the shortest shorts, cowboy boots, a bolo, a, a check shirt, a bolo, and a cowboy hat, and he would spit into his little, yeah. So anyway, I this guy remember sounds awesome. I went out and he had had the same agent for <laughs> twenty five. He had had the same agent for twenty five years, and the guy was raping him. And I don't even know how I got in there, but his CFO at the time let me in, and I go and I do my thing, and I saved him three hundred thousand dollars. And I gave wow. him better coverage, whatever. Now, this was before the days of PowerPoint. So I go in with my sales team. One of them was a good old boy from Georgia. And another one was another good old boy also, from, not maybe from Georgia, but whatever. The other guy was from Georgia. And so I, you know, I had my team and we go in and I've got my stack of paper and I've got my bullet points and I start going through it. And I'm like, Mr. Bergeron, thank you for the time. Blah, blah, blah. And he says to me, little lady, what's the bottom line? I mean, literally, he said that to me, little lady, what's the bottom line? And I said, I'm saving you 300 grand. And he looked yeah, at me. Yeah, I just looked at him and said, <laughs> well, big fella, I'm saving <laughs> you. you know, come on, man. So, uh... I, so I, <laughs> I figured we were good. And he looked at his CFO and he says to him, did you know about this? And he goes, yeah, he says, I'm handling it. And he says, thank you for your time. And he was finished. He was done. So he ended up basically turning our numbers over to his agent and his agent matched our quote. And that was really fun. So he called me back and he, you know, said, look, I really was rooting for you, but my board of directors overruled me. And I yeah, won't whatever. tell you what. Grow a set, Bergeron. Come mm. on. Yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, obviously I won't tell you what I said, but there were a few four letter words involved because at that point I had nothing to lose. A few years mm -hmm. later, the CFO had died and he hired somebody else in who knew nothing about insurance so i befriended her got back in i told her the story from the last time i'm like i am not doing this dance with you people again there will be no second pricing and she said no no and i won the account the second pass through and they were a client until i left liberty mutual so they were client for many many years but hmm. that was probably the only time that i can recall like overtly being like when he called me little lady that yeah. was that was that was very interesting to me with my new york jewish upbringing little lady okay whatever so but i never thought it's a great question david and i just i never thought of it i never considered myself i mean yes you'd be stupid not to acknowledge the fact that you're a woman in a man traditionally man's occupation but i just never let it bother me i just did my thing you know i went out and i and i told people what i knew and i 
I helped them understand their insurances and, and I was very, very successful on the, on the company side. And then I just, on the brokerage side, I did the same thing, but I did a lot more networking. So now I mentor people like Sierra. I'm on a lot of boards. I'm, um, I'm a director for the National Association of Women in Construction, no surprise there. I'm the membership chair for the Florida Design and Construction Professionals, no surprise there. So, and, and, I, and I continue to, um, to, to find younger women and mentor them. I do that a lot. And I also do a tremendous amount of public speaking. I just spoke last week before the Florida Institute of CPAs, FICPA. They wanted to know, they wanted me to do a new presentation. So that was kind of fun. I had to build a new presentation, the state of the insurance industry in the world of COVID. And that was actually pretty fun hmm. putting that together. But obviously, I mean, you know, we're in the hardest market that I've ever seen in my 37 years. I mean, you know, our industry is cyclical and usually you see one line of coverage that's giving you agita, but every single, I've never seen anything like that. Ever. Yes, you know what? That that's an interesting point too because I liken where we're at right now to when I first got into the industry, which was oh four, in oh. the in that like the the property wow. piece of it was right. um, really really tough. But you're right; like it's literally every line of coverage. I don't know of one line of coverage that has better than average rating and prices right now. I mean, oh, yeah. we, we're heavy. My, my preference is residential service contractors. I like plumbers, HVAC, and electricians sure. because I know that I can deal with a reasonable sized account yep. that's going to have enough meat on the bone that it's going to pay me to be able to deliver all of the things that we deliver on the back end. I also right. know they're big enough to have problems, but not so big that they can fix those problems internally. So they're not gonna have a risk manager. Most right. of them aren't gonna have an HR person. So we can go in and, and implement, you know, Think HR, now Mineral. We can go in with, with KPA and give them certificate monitoring and job site evaluation tools and all of the things that we do that way. And we can typically win on the value of all of the stuff that we can do because we're looking at total cost of risk i'm not just looking at right. what's your insurance premium okay right, of course. And, and you you know the drill because you deal with construction guys all the time you walk in you Absolutely. look at the loss runs there's no there's no claims under five thousand dollars well why don't you have claims under five thousand dollars oh we, we keep those away from the insurance company we don't we don't we don't uh we don't we pay those out of pocket. Well, well, great, Einstein. You just accepted liability for a claim that you didn't notify your carrier about. Right. And by the way, there's a thing called a deductible credit. You're operating like you have a five thousand dollar deductible, yet you're not even bothering to to tell your carrier who would be perfectly fine with you doing that and save you some money on the premium and get you to get their resources in the event that there's a claim mm -hmm. so that the claim can be settled for less. I mean, we could go days uh, in, in talking about that, but we love being able to go in there. I mean, my goodness, cyber, management liability, professional liability, GL, auto, umbrella is nearly impossible. Property yeah. is restricted again. Yeah. Like I've never, I've never seen it like this. I just had citizens reject an application from one of my clients who's a, a trim carpenter, they do millwork and stuff. And they're in a building, it's a commercial condo, and the roof is from 2006. So, I mean, that's only 15 years, right? And citizens rejected them. I'm like, I didn't even think they could do that. So we put them with Weston, but still, I, I just, I was like, wow, when citizens is saying no thank you, you, you got, but it's interesting because, so, uh, Again, being having done this for so many years, you can see the wave. And unfortunately, our industry really has learned nothing as best as I can tell as far as being proactive. The insurance industry tends to be so incredibly reactive, right? So the only reason that policies had a bacteria exclusion or a virus exclusion was because of SARS and H1N1 and Legionnaire's disease. If we hadn't had, had any of that, all of those COVID claims would have been covered. So, you mm -hmm. know, until Chinese drywall happened, you didn't have any of that. Until EFIS happened, you didn't have any of those exclusions. And so what we've seen and what I've seen happen is so with EPLI, right, Employment Practices Liability, all of the policies initially included uh, wage and hour. Now it's only wage and hour defense, and it's limited. It's a sublimit. So Yeah, cyber, most of the time at like 25000 bucks if you're lucky. Correct. 
So cyber, and then if you're a restaurant, you want wage an hour, forget that, but okay. So then cyber, with cyber, I'm like, there's no, these policies are so woefully under, underpriced. Now, granted, you don't have a tremendous amount of exposure with a contractor for cyber, other than maybe social engineering, but still the exposure is there. I mean, I did have one of my clients and we recommend on every single proposal, cyber, EPLI, it's in our suite of recommended coverages. And I, I have one particular client who's a GC, Paper General, and um, she did not want to buy cyber. And I said, she says, I just don't see the exposure. So I sent her all these examples, told her all these stories, and she said, no, 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 thank you. About six months later, she calls me. She says, I need you to not say I told you so. And I said, okay. And sure enough, man, their office manager got an email. Uh, one of the subcontractors said, please wire X dollars to this account for invoice number, blah, blah, blah. And it was a social engineering. It was a fish. It was fake. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those types of things happen. And so I know, I knew that cyber was woefully underpriced and it was just a matter of time. And in fact, in my research that I did for this new presentation that I built, according to, I think it was Veronis, they said that in March of 2020, scams increased by 400%, right? COVID really wow. desperate times call for desperate measures. 400% increase in scams. So what do you think that's going to do to cyber? Exactly mm -hmm. what we're seeing now. And my boss sent an article, which I then forwarded to my database of insurance buyers and stuff that says that, you know, you're looking at in the next uh, 24 to 36 months or whatever it is, uh, doubling of prices, decreasing of exposure. No surprise. Any of us that have been doing this for a while could see that coming a mile away. Absolutely. But I agree with you. I've never seen it where property, liability, excess, auto. You know what's happened to auto pricing here in South Florida? That's we crazy. Used to, write, um, used to be able to write a little like Ford F-150 pickup truck that would tool around to the job sites. Remember construction, right? Um, full million dollars liability, comp collision. I usually only write about 20000 in UM if the vehicles are only for business use for obvious reasons, right? So... You could get those full coverage, full coverage for like fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars. You know, clean MBRs, good driving records, whatever. Now, the best risk five thirty five hundred programs, MBR criteria, whatever. Yeah, you're talking about thirty five, forty five, five, and then the ones who don't. I mean, I remember back in the day, those um, extra heavy truck tractors, those Mack tractors, would be like eight, ten grand in Miami, and I'm like, whoa. Now. 30. You're seeing, you're seeing that on really even medium weight construction vehicles. I've never, I mean, I, I, I used to have all of my clients that have their vehicles that they drive personally, would, but also for business, they would always put them on the business policy because they, they could deduct it, you know, tax deduction, whatever, whatever. Well, those vehicles now can still be purchased maybe $1,500 on the personal line. You know, because you don't need the same million dollars of coverage that we write on the commercial side. Mm -hmm. And they're all moving the vehicles off of the business policy and insuring them personally now. Huge, huge dollars. Yeah, it's it's crazy because I, I talk about that all the time. I don't know how the service contractors are going to be able to continue to keep pace. You're only, I mean, you're only going to be able to raise your pricing to a certain level. But back to your point on cyber, I, I've noticed something else not and, and I'm, look people this isn't like it's a major epiphany anybody who pays attention would notice this but i don't think we're going to be far removed to where cyber is a compulsory coverage mandated by the federal government i don't i don't think we are i think that if you look at what's going on right now you've already got states like new york where it is mandatory um and then you see some of the legislation coming down through congress that they're basically laying the groundwork for it. I mean, it, it is going to be just like workers comp because for many businesses, it is a huge exposure. It doesn't matter, you know, whether they think they have the exposure or not. Manufacturers, huge exposure. You know, yeah. somebody hacks in and shuts down their main, you know, their main server and they can't operate their, their automated equipment or whatever. Yeah, they're yeah. going to be highly likely to, to pay a ransomware claim to get that back up and running and it's not yeah. it's not the municipalities i mean even though that it is i mean for crying out loud freaking cna was down for two weeks or whatever it was and then i just saw they paid like 
some ridiculous amount. I want to say like forty million or something like that. They paid <laughs> out. Yeah, I saw I saw the article and I don't remember what the number was either. But yeah, that that's doesn't it? It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. I, w I wanted to go back just for a second to the mentorship that you had brought up. I mean, you know, you obviously have tons of knowledge and experience, you know, in, in the industry. Um, what's, you know, what's a piece of advice that you would give to uh, new producers? Uh, great question. Um, work hard, work smart. Uh, get a really good center of influence where people respect and appreciate what you do. Because I remember the very first thing that, that was so different for me moving from the company side to the brokerage side is again, when I was at Liberty, I had a proprietary suite of products. I didn't need to differentiate myself from anybody. I could pick up the phone and call any business and say, yeah, I know you already have an agent, but, and it's a lot harder to do that when everybody's got the same contracts and everybody's got in-house safety and and claims and all of that kind of stuff. So how do you differentiate yourself? So the way that 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 you can do that is you build a circle of, of a center of influence or a circle of people who know and appreciate and respect you and will talk you up and bring you into their clients because the warm referral is obviously the best referral and having a cold call on the brokerage side that just sucks. You know, there's just nothing fun about that. So I would say work hard, work smart. If I, have a passion for what you do. Really get excited when you're able. The very, very best day that I ever had in the industry was I had been trying to get into uh, a family owned and operated business for five years. And you know, you're calling, you're sending information throughout the year, but you're calling 90, 120 days out asking for the appointment. And the one year after five years in a row, I called and I got the son on the phone and dad had passed away. And the son knew that he didn't know enough about insurance and he needed some help. And he's like, yeah, I'll talk to you. And I came in and I met with him, his CFO, his CPA, his mom, and his operations guy. And we, we were there for, we went through every single aspect of the business and we found out that he hadn't been getting, listen to this one, the Florida Contractors Classification Premium Adjustment Credit, right? Dave's rolling his eyes. Every, so, let, me, let me ask just for two seconds, how many times have you actually found it on the policy? Like that, well, that's what anymore. I- Not anymore, they did away with it in 2009 for the most part, but let me tell you the story there and the punchline of that story is we were able to retroactively go back and save the guy 150 grand. We went back three what yep. NCCI would allow and retroactively capture those credits. And then we saved him another $69,000 on the, the policy that we wrote for him. And he wasn't getting the drug free or the safety credits. Mm -hmm. And so we cleaned all of that up and then we attacked the property and liability. And he didn't have blanket coverage, even though we had two buildings side by side and moved inventory back and forth all the time. And he didn't have replacement costs and he didn't have the right limits, whatever, whatever. 10 months later, Hurricane Wilma literally took the roof of his building off and he liberty paid him two and a half million dollars and i did like a, a a retroactive assessment of what he would have gotten with his old agent and between the penalties for the co-insurance and the ordinary payroll exclusion and all the other crap that was on his policy he would have gotten 750 grand we got mm. he got two and a half million dollars and he called me and he said, you know, my dad would be so proud of me today. You saved, we, we saved the business. You, the work that you did, you saved our family business. That was the best day I ever had in insurance. It's so, awesome. You know, have a passion, really, really love what you do. People will see that because if they're interviewing two or three different agents and you're a new agent, it's going to be really, really hard for you to bring something to the table that those other people don't have. Right. I mean, if, if, you, if I'm up against a new agent, chances are better than not that I'm going to win because I have the knowledge, I have the experience, I have the contracts and I have the passion. So if you're a new producer, you got to work hard, you got to work smart and you got to have a passion. And I don't think there's that many, you know, we, any of us that have been around for a long time know that our industry is aging out. And it's a big problem because there's not a lot of new, young, excited blood coming into the insurance industry. And I don't see that there's ever going to be a time where insurance is not needed by businesses. It's not something 
that's going to go away in the future. It's, it's always going to be a part of our society. It's always going to be a part of our, our business lives. So it's, it's an important industry. And I think that, that the fact that we don't have people that want to be a part of that and we are aging out is a problem. So I would add one. Mentor. Yeah, I would add one more thing to what you said, and that is be consistent. Oh, yeah. Stay, stay in the, stay in the game, and be consistent every single day. Yeah. You know, you come, you come from a company in Liberty that you knew your behavior was what they needed to be every single day. You knew you yep. needed to make X number of phone calls. I mean, when you, I was just laughing when you said, "Oh, my hit rate." I'm like, I have hmm. never met somebody that came from Liberty that was there for any length of time that didn't know their numbers. And that yep. would be the last thing that I would say is if you're a producer, know your numbers, right? I mean, it's one thing for you to be accountable to your clients, but you also have to be accountable to the firm that's yep. giving you the opportunity. And part of that's knowing your numbers and running your business like you're running a business, period. And yeah. I think that we, we miss there a, a lot as well. But that being said, I want to be respectful of your time. We're coming up on uh, on noon, our time, and I've got a meeting at noon, and I'm sure that you've got way better things to do with your time than hang out with us. But That was awesome. I loved it. Thank you yeah. so much for talking with me. So, so, yeah, and we really appreciate you coming on. Your story is a good one. It's relatable, and it's one that a lot of people need to hear. And honestly, it's not like we just need ladies to hear this and get inspired because I'm pretty sure you're cleaning men's plows every day on the streets too. <laughs> so if anything, they need to realize that, you know, the mentality is I'm going out there because I'm knowledgeable, I'm good at what I do, and I've got a lot of experience at it, period. That's where it ends. So I appreciate you sharing your story with yep. us today. Look forward to having this episode come out. And we will catch everybody next time. See ya. Cool. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com.